Hey guys, just want to make a quick video before you guys see episode 14. 14, yeah, 14. Um, just want to make a quick sponsorship video. Say thank you to Sparso. Um, but anyways, here is their ad. Hopefully you guys like it. So as usual, thank you Sparso for sponsoring this video, uh, this video. As always, links in the description box down below if you guys want to check them out. Um, help buying stuff from them actually helps us build and make more content for you guys. And for the fact that uh, we are looking for a studio, we discuss this later on in the video. But yeah, check them out. As always, links in the description box down below. Uh, they are an organic soap company that provides ringworm and all the things. So if you're like me, or or bat who is both martial artists and I lift on I lift as well. So as a result, you don't know who's touching what, and obviously you don't want to stay. You obviously want to stay clean. So might as well kill two birds with one stone with getting spar soap. Uh, they actually help fight, help fight ringworm and like a few other things. So those of you who are martial artists, you guys can keep. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting ringworm and passing it on to fellow teammates and stuff like that. So yeah. Check them out. Always, as always, links in the description box down below. And here is episode 14. Hopefully you guys like it. What's up, guys? How's it going? It's your boy coming back for another video on this channel. I am obviously the Rhino. This is, again, my friend Pranav from college. He was on episode 13. 13. Uh, on this podcast. So if you haven't seen that one, I would suggest uh, uh, check out the link below or searching our YouTube channel here on YouTube or any podcast of your selection. So Pranav, welcome back to the show. Hey, Rhino. Thanks a lot for having me back. You're our first guest who's made a return on the show. Really? Yeah. Looks like there's a first for everything. Hey, ain't that the truth? All right. So let's give a quick rundown of what's being discussed today. Um, it's okay. going to be a little different than than most other episodes in the past. Um, this was actually from uh, a request from my end this time around to do a little enough, bit. Right? What's that? Is it surprisingly enough, right, guys? Yeah, surprisingly enough. Um, and the reason why I had decided to go through this is to basically bring to light the fact that everyone is doing everyone now of themselves at some way shape or form and it needs to be a jackass but it kind of cut off for a minute it's fine it's fine i'm sure that this happens anyways while we're doing it so the whole concept of doing this and maybe going into a couple of videos just talking about what we're going to be talking about today is the main it, the main inspiration is the fact that everyone that I've been seeing, well, seeing either through video calls or just talking to them on the phone, have really been spending some significant time just improving themselves, be it from a technology standpoint, which will be really a main, the main focus of the discussion today, to let's say learning a new hobby or reading a new book, maybe starting to go on this Netflix and binge and that whole craze, what have you. So we're going to actually be talking a little bit about what the hell it is that I do and what the hell goes into doing what I do. Um, we're going to take a look at something known as .NET Core, which sounds massive, sounds complex, and if you are wondering whether or not it is complex, it indeed is complex. But today we want to kind of break it down to a, an idiot's guide into programming. I'm sure that you guys might have gone to the library, which still exists now, even to this day, and maybe borrowed a book that said, you know, an idiot's guide to C++ or C++ for dummies. So 
Why does this sound familiar all of a sudden? <laughs> That's because it, because because someone that you call a genius is actually going through it with you, you know, live. So anytime that you guys are stuck with any of this, I, you, I, I know why it sounds familiar because I was the one who I was the dumbass who did that. <laughs> well, well, now this time, you know, think of this as C plus plus dummies has officially come to life. You know, you have someone who's in the field. Someone, well. I mean, I, I don't really consider myself as a genius or a subject matter expert by no means. So throwing that out there. So chances are that, that you will be seeing mistakes being made by someone who may have five years of experience, a little over five years, and everyone still makes the same rookie mistakes. So with that, let's actually go ahead and get started on what you need to do to actually try and follow along with some of the stuff that we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're going to be looking at something known as .NET Core, as I said at the beginning. And .NET, for those who do not know what the hell that is, is and I, was about, and I was about to ask that question. Genius, you know, you know, uh, smart folks think alike, or something right. to that extent. Um, great minds think alike. That's the that's the whole uh, phrase yeah. that I was getting at. So .NET, for those who are either wondering what is this Greek and Latin terminology, is the fact that this is a family of technologies that has been invented completely by Microsoft. Uh, .NET is a, not, it's not like it's a framework, but it really is, think of .NET as being as an umbrella. Think of .NET being a conglomerate company where you will have different technologies in that company or in that conglomerate. So, for example, if you look at, I don't know, a good example would be the Fiat Group. If you look at the Fiat Group as this conglomerate, you have Dodge, you'll have Ram, you'll have Viper. So, just like that, yeah. within, yeah, Fiat itself. So, within that, so just like that, analogous to that, within .NET, you have C Sharp, you'll have ASP.NET, you have ASP.NET Core, but we're going to be looking at completely .NET Core. Now, what is the difference between .NET and .NET Core? You might want to, if you are a programmer or if you're in computer science, and if you're or watching this video- interested in going into computer science. Okay. The question that I just asked, what is the difference between .NET and .NET Core, believe it or not, gets asked all the time in interviews. I kid you not. So these, next couple of uh, you know these episodes or whatever we're discussing today not only has some stuff that's talking about you know what dotnet is and how do you create a dotnet application or going through some basics which i intend to do today but also will come in with nuggets of what actually gets asked on these interviews when you are let's say applying for a, a developer full-time job or even when you're actually applying for just a programmer or a software developer internship at say Google, Microsoft, or any of the big, you know, the big four, the big five. Um, any that, big tech company. Any big, well, any tech company. It doesn't have to be right. big, doesn't have to be small. It can be any size, but but don't be surprised if certain questions that are that could be touched upon, we they will be asked like without a doubt. Like I would, you know, you know, kind of slip my wrist and write it on the wall if I had to. That's that's how serious it is. We we don't, here right out of the bat, we don't support, if you are suicidal, please see someone. See, yes, yes, but I, I um, kind of, yeah, thank you, but I did make just that. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. Yes, but I brought that in, I brought that in because I wanted to, uh, you know, address the fact that it's not something that if that it comes out of my my mouth and it goes into the ears of God. No, these are questions that are, are always asked 99 not 99 100 percent of the time on these interviews so let's go ahead i'm going to get started so first and foremost you want to download what's known as an sdk now i'm going to throw a lot of um terminologies and acronyms um rhino let me know if you're able oh, you're not able to see it are you yeah. uh it says you're starting to share screen share yes okay okay so it's taking a little bit time let me know when you're able to see the, the screen. All right, so while we wait here for, for the screen to share, what is a, what was that word you said, dot SD right. or? Okay, so good question. So an SDK, so what in the hell 
is in fact an SDK. An SDK is known as Software Development Kit. Do you guys actually see this screen, Rhino? Yeah, I, I see the screen. All right, so an SDK means Software Development Kit. Now, a Software Development Kit, think of it as a digital library. This digital library that you have comes in with a lot of different sub libraries within it that allow you to do different things. Maybe create, let's say, a web application, a web API. That's, you know, APIs are now the thing now that, that they are the trend nowadays. And the reason that is, is because we as humans produce a lot more data than we actually consume. And one perfect example of that would be the fact that we have things that can measure how much time we spend on doing a task. You know, they have these little nifty dice like devices that if you put it onto one side or whatever side that's facing up, you know, it'll start you know, t tracking how much time you're spending on it. So if you take a six sided die, one side is writing code, another one is writing documents, a third could be taking a break, a fourth could be drinking coffee, a fifth could be playing games, and a sixth could be watching YouTube, right? Whatever side of that die is facing up, then there will be like a time tracker according you know, associated to it. So for those kind of functionalities, you'll need to have software development kits from which you can access a lot of classes and libraries and methods. And we'll go into all of that in live detail right now. So first step that you wanna do is install the SDK for .NET Core, uh, which is version 3.1. You have the ability of downloading just your x64 your x86 right here so you can download that and you can go through the installation process it also thing looks is like you can, it looks like you can also use uh, mac and linux yes so that's another thing that is um a point to note about .NET versus .NET core .NET core is what's known as an open sourced version of the .NET of .NET Meaning that it doesn't have to be that if you're writing a .NET application, um, it doesn't have to be run specifically on, on a Windows PC. It can actually be run on a Mac or a Linux box instead. So mm -hmm. for my setup and for purposes of today, I've already installed Microsoft Visual Studio 2019 Community. And that is actually a free IDE, Visual Studio being one of the best, if not the best IDE that I've used in all my five years of experience. So NetBeans can suck on it. Um, oh, by the way, if you, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, they'll be in the links in the description box down below in case you are interested in doing this. Yes, definitely. Uh, and of course, go to google.com, look for Visual Studio 2019 Community Edition and make sure that when you install Visual Studio that you have the ability of selecting certain workloads and make sure that one of the workloads that you select is .NET Core. Some of those things that we'll do today are gonna to be through what's known as a .NET CLI and CLI means command line interface, which means you'll see a black screen. I'm gonna type some stuff on the keyboard. I'm gonna hit an enter key and don't worry, everything that's gonna run will come off of my, uh, my development machine that I have here. And it's not gonna go into the NSA or the FBI or the CIA. So just throwing that out there, anytime we're doing anything from let's say a CLI perspective, we're not gonna be looking to go outside of our own, what I would call as a sandbox or going outside of our own little domain. Domain isn't the right word here, but we're not going outside of the of our computer, basically. We're not gonna reach outside of the computer. That's the best way of explaining it. Couple of other things that I wanna bring up is we're gonna, I'm going to be referencing, or you guys can have this, it's a .NET CLI cheat mm -hmm. sheet. Now this cheat sheet would be able to give you an idea of what kind of commands you can run. Mm -hmm. And we will be running actually a .NET new console in a minute. But once you've actually gone ahead and let's say you've downloaded your .NET Core SDK and you've installed it, um, 
the second thing I would actually want you to get is a tool by the name of Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code, think of it as your famous Notepad++ application, but on steroids. It's a lot faster, a lot more efficient, a lot more powerful in my honest opinion. And I use this when I'm writing, let's say, an application for a web app in either a front-end technology like Angular or using a .NET Core API, or if I'm writing a simple .NET Core console application, which we will do shortly. So any questions right now, by the way, so far? No, I'm good so far. All right, so. And by the way, if, you're, if anyone who's watching this on YouTube is wondering how to do everything, I'll put your questions in the comments down below, or if I can, I'll get uh, Pranav's Instagram, and you can directly message him directly. Yep, so by the way, Instagram is at pkrish19. Uh, you guys can send the DMs over there and make sure to keep it clean, please. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go a little bit into CLI, but as we're gonna go into CLI, I'm gonna take a little bit of a backstory of how programming got to be programming, in fact, and give you a little bit of tidbits here and there. Programming didn't, programming has evolved, has come in when mathematics was immediately invented. That's a given. When you have mathematics, you're gonna have programming. Now, historically speaking, the very first programmer wasn't a man. Historically speaking, the very first programmer was a woman of yeah. British royalty. Did not know that part. I realized it was the first programmer was a woman, but didn't realize it was a British royal. Yes, it was a British royal, Count Ada Lovelace, believe it or not. I think in 1813 was the first, was the very first programmer and also the very, historically the very first female programmer. Okay, now, so when did this happen? Because obviously computers weren't, haven't been around since the day before forever, so. Well, so think about it this way. When you have, you had your very first form of programming, even prior to the baggage, uh, Charles uh, uh, Gabbage or baggage, I think it's Charles Baggage, um, right. that prior to that, you had something known as an abacus, right? So right. when you had abacus that was used in either, you know, ancient India and of course in the Middle China. East, you no, have that, like you have that ability of saying, okay, there was an actual flow. There was a, a somewhat of a quote unquote logic that you had, let's say you had your singles row, you had your tens row, you had your hundreds row, your thousands, your um, 10,000, 100,000, et cetera. So it was like every single 10 micro units of the row above would be one unit of the, of the next row. So if it was, right. if I had moved 10, one's units all the way to the right, then I could move uh, a unit from the 10, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the abacus. And that is how you're able to figure out, okay, what number is being shown on the abacus. Right. Now, years go by, and even after Count Ada Lovelace does her thing with computer programming, and Charles Baggage has actually invented the first computer, Things are, are still not smart, even in the year of 2020, because here's something, here's another thing. Are computers actually smart? No, they're not. They're rather dumb. Now, right. this will come as a shock, but a computer that I use or you use or a phone that you use or any piece of hardware for that matter can only do seven operations. Add, right. subtract, multiply, divide, and three logical operations, logical and, logical or, and logical not. Okay. So when it comes to programming, it is you're doing something where you're modifying the hardware that you're actually, pro, you're actually writing code for, and you're taking these seven operations and doing things in different ways. And you have basically these languages which are as vast as the number of languages that, you know, I could speak to Rhino or Rhino can speak to his family. Or Just like I that. You. Yeah, exactly. There are so many different languages that can be work, can, that, that can be used to even write a single line of code, even just to, for the most basic example of hello world. 
which we'll get to very shortly. So, right. uh, Rhino, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing a few things where we're going to, first of all, use the command prompt. Uh, since I'm running a Windows machine, if you're running something on Mac, press uh, command and spacebar, type in terminal, and that would get you to a similar window that you would see here. Now, if you're now from here, the steps are quite similar. In fact, they're almost identical. And and the beauty of .NET Core in terms of the .NET uh, .NET um, is that you don't have to, it doesn't care what platform you're running. It'll give you the ability to execute some specific commands. Doesn't matter where the hell you're running it on. You can do. And what we'll do is we'll start playing around with this by first finding out what version is installed. So first tip would actually be to write this out. So go ahead, I'm actually going to quickly increase the font size so that way it's a little bit better for everyone to see. Um, properties. And let's make it at 28. So Rhino, is this good for you? You can, you're able to see it on your side? Holy crap, that's big, but yeah. All right, let me, let me. And yeah, so that's what you said. Um, Oh God, here we go. You know, um, yeah, we, we, we throw jokes around a lot. So, um, yeah, so we, we have like Pranav here is basically family to me. So I can say that around him. Yes, for sure. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at something and we're going to look at the .NET version so we can do .NET dash V. It might give us an error, but what that means to say is I'm going to look at the .NET. Oh, it's double dash. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do .NET double dash version. Now, what we do is we're putting in a command and then we're going to put in what's known as an option. Now an option could be .NET double dash version to tell us what version of .NET core we're using. And it'll tell us that it's 3.1.401. I do not know why, but it's a version of Pi and I'm going to leave it at that. So <laughs> it just doesn't have the 9.5.2. You know. Yeah, I was about to ask, like, why is it 3.1.401 versus 3.1415? Okay, great question. So what happens is that every single time that there are some updates to um, something like .NET or .NET Core, they right. have this habit of versioning things. You know, when it comes to, let's say you, you create an application, you release it out on the market. The very first thing you're going to do is version 1.0. Just like that with .NET, dot, and specifically here, it's .NET Core. Um, we're going to look at, you know, .NET Core started out as .NET Core 1.0, then 2.0, then 2.1, then 2.2. Now it's at 3.1, 3, you know, 3.0, 3.1. And each time that you have a new version of .NET Core, you'll have what are known as release notes. And release notes help you to determine what in fact is new about that version of .NET Core. So that's why you see it as 3.1.401 because it's a major, minor, and built. That's how the versioning works. Anything else? Oh, this, is gonna be, this seems like a pain in the ass on my part. I mean, you know what? No question's too dumb, right? So It just seems like, uh, at least in my opinion, like, yes, I'm a mechanical engineer, and to a lesser degree, I understand what you're doing, but it's just like I don't have the patience to do this stuff. Well, <laughs> well enough, he, right? I mean, that's true, but then at the same time, being a mechanical engineer, you should still know how to write code. Yeah, um, the, it, it's come to the point where nowadays you can be in the medical industry. You need to know Python in order to take a look at, um, let's say, an experiment that you ran to find, let's say, a, a cure for COVID-19. You need to be able to understand whether or not it's successful. So you have, let's say, a data, you have a data set that you can call as your control set. You have a data set now that's, let's say, your um, your very you know your your variable set the, the new data that you collected and you're going to have to write a program to say okay how off am I how how or how good is our is our is our vaccine for example 
So you need to know how to write code in order to get to that get to that uh, stage. In fact, there was I was in NYIT in my undergrad class. There was an article published about the logic that was used to create every single NFL schedule. Damn. Like, and believe it or not, it was used in an interpretive language. Now, what is an interpretive versus object oriented is another uh, discussion on its own and we'll get into that soon. What we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna execute a DIR command, which will tell me, okay, give me my directory. And we're gonna go ahead and start writing some code. So I'm gonna go ahead and on Mac as well, you can do make dir, which is make directory to be able to actually create a folder on your system. Cool. Uh, by the way, before we continue, uh, it looks like the bat finally joined. Oh, really? Yeah. So, Victor, if you're there, you mind turning on your camera and meeting Pranav? Uh, I guess he's not there, but okay. Uh, there you are. He is. What's there up, Victor? You are. Hey, Bat, what's, up, what's going on? Yeah. All right, late for the party. Uh, uh, I think that, he, he, that, he joined in at the right time. That was my fault. <laughs> well, well, Bat and Rhino, you, you joined in. Well, the Bat, you, you flew in at the right time, no pun intended. So right. just going over a couple of things of what, what the hell is going on and why we're doing what we're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and going to write a command, which is make dir, M-K-D-I-R. That's actually going to create a folder for you. And I'm going to call it as net core lectures so this way you can actually create a folder for .NET core lectures and I'm going to run a DIR again to list out all my folders and files so right. now that we have the .NET core lectures folder we're going to go ahead and I'm going to do a CD which will change my directory into .NET core lectures and we're going to actually start creating a, a .NET application a, dot, a .NET core console application at that so it's .NET new console and I'm going to do a dash O. This will have its own, this will allow us to open the uh, the project for us and this will be a hello net core. So by actually doing this what's going to happen is it's going to create us a project and write a little bit of code for us which I'm going to go ahead and start modifying and breaking down as to what the hell happens when someone says okay I'm running something hold on hold on I'm running a program what actually goes into the process of it. So Anytime you guys got questions, fire away. Okay. All right. So I'm going to so go ahead. The the water you can have for the rest of this conversation. <laughs> What's that? Is this the new Xbox or something? It says Microsoft. <laughs> Just <in concept. laughs> Is it the new Xbox? Well, I mean, have you seen the new Xbox, by the way, the bat? <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like a tower, like a little, little tower fridge. Yep. Yeah, it does. It looks like a mini fridge or something or the other. All right, so I'm going to go into hello net core and then I'm going to go code dot, which will allow for the project itself to be open inside of Visual Studio Code. So just give it a minute as my, my computer runs like a lazy Susan sometimes. Not sometimes. Oh shut up! I'm get I'm getting RAM anyway, so it's gonna it's gonna speed up sooner or later. <laughs> That's what she said. Oh God, you and your you and your jokes. Yeah, I try. <laughs> Not gonna lie, he always says that. That's one of his mottos, I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It is. It's his. That's his. Like that's his mantra, dude. Like that's his lifelong mantra. It's like that's what she said. <laughs> All right, so. As you can see, what the hell happened? So what's gonna what happens every single time that you say, okay, I want to do a .NET console new means it's gonna give you a new console project. It's gonna give you a CS proj um, folder or file rather, which is a CS project. Um, I'm actually gonna go ahead. I'm gonna install a couple of extensions, which will allow for some fancy code completion. Meaning, as you're typing, you will get some necessary like prompts to say, okay, what is it that, that you're trying to do? Uh, and we'll go ahead and start modifying some code. So every single time that you have this file with the .cs extension, keep in mind that the .cs means C sharp. 
It's mm -hmm. actually like the musical note C sharp. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do control tilt sign on the keyboard and I'm going to give you show you like the same kind of terminal or command prompt interface that I have here is what I can actually be able to use out here. And this is actually just downloading packages. So I'll just go ahead and where the hell did the CMD go? Debug console problems terminal. There we go. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do something when I execute a couple of commands dot net build, which will actually take the entire program itself and do a syntax check or kind of like a grammatical check. Grammar in the world of programming is completely different. It's going to build your application. Just give it a second. It'll build the application. And then after that, I'll execute dot net run, which will then show the actual application in work. And that's pretty much how you can actually get started. Just give it time again, since my, uh, it's not found early. So stop that control C. <clears throat> Everything happens on the fly. Dot net, dot net run. It'll take some time and then say, it'll basically say, hello world on the console. If I go into dot net, run here. We'll see which, which side gets actually executed first. I think the left one would. So while we wait, my question, I have a question for you, Pranav. Um, yep. If someone is interested in becoming a computer scientist, how would mm -hmm. one go about doing that? Well, of course, you need to go through college. Get, you know, get to say that you are in that field. But a lot of, but nowadays, what's going on is you have a lot of boot camps that are dedicated for coding specifically. Right. And while you are learning, let's say, a technology right out the gate, they will teach you some other key concepts that are like the holy grail that or that would make up the holy grail of programming. Concepts such as, you know, what makes a language an object oriented language, abstraction, inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, what, ev what does everything, what does all of that uh, mean? And then what happens is that you have, again, these are just errors because I'm running two things that are, one is saying, oh, by the way, it's being used by another. So let me try it again. And going back to your question is, it'll teach you these coding camps that'll go over like, you know, four months will teach you data structures, algorithms, everything that you need to know about, you know, and a, a programming language apart from the technologies themselves. That's one way if you do not come from, let's say a technical background. Okay, that makes sense. I also have a question too. I think one of my friends also done this, a boot, like boot camp, something, it took him four weeks, right? Mm -hmm. um, down in Fremont, I believe he took it. Okay. Now he works at now he works like at a bank, I think. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's like that's that's definitely because you know, a part of it is they're not just teaching you skills that you need to know yeah. for being a programmer, but then they'll be able to prep you up for interviews like that as well. Like a lot of, I know that there's like a lot of companies that have these success stories where, oh, we'll place you in Microsoft, we'll place you in Google, we'll place you in Amazon. But then it's like mm -hmm. it's not they who are doing the damn job search, it's you who's doing the damn the, the, the damn job search, you know? So right. it's like, you know, so basically when you go into these interviews, you know what you know and what you don't know, you should admit and be willing to learn. So while we were just talking about that, when I executed the .NET run command, you can see how it just printed out hello world right here. Hello so world. So I can make a quick change. Yep, hello world and said, instead of it saying hello world, I'll make it a little bit more fancy and say var uh, podcast name, console.reline, and I'll explain what the hell I'm doing. And then we will go into 
why it is what it is. So I'm going to write, let's say, greet, greet podcast using the podcast name, right? And then, and then say, uh, So then static void greet podcast string name. All right. So now if I do this and say dot net run, the first thing that the, the the CLI or this command line interface is going to ask you is give me the name of the, the podcast. So once that happens, it would uh, be able to provide a value for it and then say, and then, so it says enter the name of the podcast to be greeted. And for this case, I'll say the rhino and the bat. And then at the end, you can see how it goes. Hello, rhino and the bat. So what happens here is that I've written a console dot right line, which basically means print out on the screen, whatever is inside these parentheses. So mm -hmm. they call this as a string. And then I'm saying, okay, I can create a var in C sharp, which means a variable. And I can give it a name such as podcast name, and it'll be whatever comes in from whatever the user types. So in this case, when I type the Ryan on the bat, and then I'm going to pass that into a method called greet podcast with the parameter name of podcast name create a function and inside that I'm just going to say hello whatever whatever information this method got it's just going to spit it right back to you in the console okay that makes sense okay so basically what happens is that when you're writing c sharp code there is a not a youtuber but there is an og programmer that I would say every person should watch the lectures of and that is uncle bob I kid you not, there is a gentleman by the name of Uncle Bob who has been in the tech business for at least maybe half of his lifetime or more. You know, he's been the programmer for about 40 years. And so basically he, the day before forever. Yes, the day before forever and then some, ever since the numbers one and zero were invented. Okay. And basically he says that you have to write, you know, the bat for you, everything that you see around you is done by people like me. Like when you are a programmer, you have a huge responsibility, but at the same time, you have an immense power that is literally like no other. Like you have the ability to help the world, but at the same time, fuck it up as much as you please. Like if, for example, if, um, if you had a grudge against Rhino for whatever reason, then the bat could come to me and say, Hey Pranav, do you think you can you can screw up Rhino for a, for a minute? And I'm like, yeah, maybe I could do that. But then turn around, I could screw you as well. So it's it, it's you know when you have this ability to know how to write code, be very very careful. If you have friends that are programmers, be very very nice to them because one thing you can say wrong and oh shoot, my now now all of a sudden you go home like. Yeah, by the way, Bat, yeah, you're, you know, the fridge will tell you that it's out of milk, but then that's one thing. But then it's another thing for you to find out that your refrigerator magically transferred 5 billion Bitcoin into your checking account. You know, that that's, um, that's when you know, like, wait a minute, something's up. But you're still screwed because even if your refrigerator tells you or sends you a text message saying that 5 billion Bitcoin was transferred into, you know, your crypto exchange, you know, you are tempted to actually access that 5 billion Bitcoin, but then all of a sudden you'll find that I have access to maybe one Bitcoin. If I want to get access to maybe 10 more, then someone will tell you, someone could tell you, oh, by the way, fill out the survey. Then let's say you do get the 10 Bitcoin. Then someone else will say, then you might getting another prompt say, give your credit card number as well. So mm -hmm. it's like, you think you have the 5 billion Bitcoin, but then it's not yours anymore. It's just a way to bait you and, and get you to give so much of information 
that you that at the end of it you realize oh shit i i, I just gave away my life savings to some unknown attacker mm-hmm. so right. you know that that's that's always always something to be weary of i kind of right. have a similar problem uh my debit card was compromised like a couple of days ago so i had to get a new debit card in and i believe it's something from like off amazon or something yeah, i don't man. know if it's from like you know it was exposed somehow <clears throat> Right, right, and yeah. that, and unfortunately, you have things like Trojan horses and phishing attacks. That's a completely another. That's like you want to get a cybersecurity expert on to f- understand what the hell all those mean. And I can only maybe give you a little bit of a of a noobish definition, but they can give you like a full proper like explanation as to why the Trojan horse was is called a Trojan horse. I mean, it's because they got the the references from Greek mythology where it's yeah. something present, very nice, something very nice. Yeah. So something very nice as a very altruistic gift, but then at the end of it, dump, dump, all hell breaks loose, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what that's why they call it as a Trojan horse. So I guess I have a question at this point, kind of going off of what you guys have been saying. Mm-hmm. How do I, like, where is the line between what, like, what you're doing, what, like, I guess you into a bigger example of what Anonymous is doing, the hacktivist group, mm-hmm. versus, I don't know, insert country A hacking the Pentagon or country B trying to rig the elections or insert whatever you want to say. Okay, so with that, let me actually just lower this a little bit. All right, so repeat the question again. So my question is, where's the line between what you're doing and being like a good guy and kind of being the bad guy and trying to rig and rig something or uh, hack the Pentagon or something else? There are really two ways of going about making that different difference uh one is of course the programmer themselves and what their right. intents are um that's always a, a telltale sign is you want to know your intentions i'm going to stop the screen share for a minute right. um and we'll get back to the actual code at another at another point in time so one thing is that you have your screen you have your intentions known you should definitely make your intentions known second thing is that whether or not any of these intrusions get reported Unfortunately, we're we're living in a world right now where it it's where these attacks become so common that it's like, all right, it's okay, it's raining outside, great. So just like that, you know, someone else just got attacked, um, which is unfortunate because then if you're not so transparent about it, then people won't know or the industry itself won't know where they need to focus on. Right. Believe it or not. So. Yeah. Um, so really the whole concept of fine line comes in between, first of all, who the programmer is and then what their intentions are. If their intentions are to, let's say, hack the Pentagon or hack or come in and intrude with an election, then they have a very, very strong ulterior motive. And, right. and you'd have to really, really know your stuff to be able to carry out such an operation one one thing is for sure you you guy damn well know how to cover up your tracks otherwise you know you can always be caught i know a, a, that's what makes a good hacker from a bad hacker a bad hacker knows like okay i'm just gonna go in do my my stuff and then i'm gonna get the hell out but meanwhile if you while getting the hell out if you don't clean up your tracks but yet still keep an open hole for you to go in again um yeah you really you you really don't know how to hack properly Right. So, what something like someone like Anonymous, which is obviously a hacktivist group, mm-hmm. would they be considered a lack of a better word? And I know I'm, I don't, I don't know if this is the right word or not. Would they be considered a quote unquote criminal because of what they're doing, or would they be considered heroes, or how would they be perceived in the computer from a computer scientist point of view? So, actually. So again, it depends upon the intention. If if anonymous is to come in and 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 say that they want to raise awareness about something, where believe it or not, they did. They actually yeah. went to a company. They went to Microsoft, and almost exposed a vulnerability within Teams. So for those folks that are part of the anonymous group, 
they would get uh, some form of an appreciation from one of the tech giants being Microsoft. Like if you're doing something that is going to help humanity at large, the, the community at large will thank you. Like they will let, they will acknowledge your contributions. They will acknowledge the fact that you are able to do something to help them, but then also help their end user base at the same time. Whereas if you're part of anonymous and say that in the name of anonymous, I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, by the way, you have to give me the, you have to give me, you know, uh, the source code of teams and let's say the Xbox series S and if you don't comply, I'm going to, you know, hack Satya Nadella's Xbox account or, or, you know, you know, in order for me to, to get away from here, I want you to give me, you know, um, five copies of, of all your latest hits, including Microsoft Flight Simulator, then that'll start raising some red flags. Well, obviously there's a line between being a total other jackass and wrecking everybody's lives and saving everyone's lives. Yes. All Very right. So. Cool. Cool. Well, Guys. I find that anonymous group pretty cool, though. Yeah, I, same here with me. I think like I remember read an article uh, like four or five years ago or something like that where they hacked uh, ISIS's website or something and changed it to gay porn. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's not not hilarious. No, 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 no. So even with that, you have things where you'll still have the jack, like you know, you'll still have like the smart Alex of the world, like the, the utter jackasses that still want to do something because they want to do something. You know, yeah. it's almost like it's like it's like a figurative. It's like a metaphorical. That's what she said when you right. when you brought that up, right? It's it's literally like that. Um, and believe it or not, then like those people are just like, okay, what the hell are you doing? I mean, it's like right. clearly you have way too much damn time on your hands to really go and change a uh, website. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you have folks that are in the intelligence community community going like, we just have, they just hit a gold mine, you know, where they have the ability to find, you know, cause now everything is that's on the internet is public and everything being right. open source and stuff like that. There are abilities to track where the information is coming from. So you have programs like Wireshark and Fiddler that you can use to be able to say, okay, I'm going to send, let's say a request to get some data or to put some data to a database. And then I wanna be able to track where the hell it goes, what IP address it hits, what IP address did things resolve to and, and stuff like that, that you can be able to track what are known as packets or those like little bits of information that go across over the wire, in which case means like, if it goes from, let's say, one Wi-Fi endpoint to another Wi-Fi endpoint, or from one, let's say, um, let's say one terminal to another terminal, then you can be able to trace, let's say, the size of the packets, what can, what data is inside the packets, what kind of uh, what kind of information is in the request or response. Okay, that makes, that's cool. No, it seems like this is a very sorry. This is a very like cool topic for me since I'm a fellow engineer. <laughs> It is, it is. And it's, and, and, and these are things where like your entire world is your oyster and you have the ability of just, you know, looking up YouTube videos of how do I create an API and then it'll go ahead and create one for you. Or how do I use something like, uh, I don't know, like Firebase and, and start using that as a database or how do I use um, something that's NoSQL like MongoDB or Azure table storage and, and how do I, and how the hell do I go about, you know, using that? Right. So, I mean, since we're going over .NET, correct? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what, my question is, what makes .NET better than, let's just say, C Sharp versus C++ versus okay. insert other coding systems? Okay, so let's, let's take a step back. Languages such as C++ and C Sharp all belong to the .NET umbrella. Right. So... If you want to take a look at, let's say, technology stack or technology flavor, if you want to compare those two, right. let's take a look at something like, let's say, what about what makes .NET and Java programming better? Like, what are some of the differences? Okay. So if you look at .NET, Java, you, of course, the languages are going to, are different by, by default, but then .NET 
has the or .NET Core. Let's make that let's make that clear. .NET Core versus Java. What are the differences? The .NET Core uh, family of technologies can run on any machine in the world. So okay. it can run specifically on middle, it can run on Windows, it can run on Linux, it can run on Mac. Java, on the other hand, can run on all three systems, but then if it runs on Windows, then you'd have a different process of running code than if you're running Java code on a Mac or Java code on a Linux. Okay, that makes sense. So like, it, depending on the system, it will change how you code. Yes, well, yes and no. So what happens with code in general is you have what's known as an entire, you have what's known as not just a compilation process, but you have um, this, this ability of, okay, you write your code, you're gonna build it, right? So when you build a code, you're checking the code to see if it's correct, where are all the semicolons there? Are the, do the parentheses match up one to another? And do and am I using the right packages? Okay. Then you have this process with languages like C Sharp and Java, where it will go into this interpretation or almost an objectification phase while it's compiling. And yeah. there, when you do the objectification part, especially with C Sharp, you'll have an OBJ folder which will contain all the binaries that are required. So every single library that you think that you need in your console application, you will have a reference there. And you'll also have a fold of file that would be your entire application enclosed in a .exe file that you can double click and run. Even the same thing happens when, you, when it goes from an object code to a binary. That's the next step where inside the bin folder of your project, you'll have the .exe, but in the object folder, you'll have the .exe and other libraries or what they call as dynamically linked libraries or DLLs right. for that matter, that would be required for your application. When you go into the bin folder or the binary folder, you'll have only the .exe, no um, think of that as a minified version of your object folder that you can then double click and run and execute. That makes sense. So did you get all that? that? <laughs> I'm still a little bit confused, but um, you know, just because like I wasn't on this field or anything at all. So, um, how do you say your name again? Pranav, right? Yep, that's right. Um, whenever you have a ch whenever you have a free chance, uh, tutor me this stuff. This stuff's really <laughs> interesting, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would do that, and I think that's the main purpose, pretty much. Is like, yeah, I'm not just tutoring you guys. I'm just tutoring the world at large. At this point, mm -hmm. we are. You know, that that's the way that things are going. And even at the start of the the episode today, I was like you know, the reason why we're doing all this is the fact that everyone at home is, they're also cooped up. So they're like, apart outside the nine to five, everyone is just trying to find a new hobby, trying to look, catch up on a TV show. They're learning, you know, to play the guitar. They're, they're doing something to help themselves better either in their career or in their personal lives. So this is one such way that you can do something where you learn a new skill in the process, but then you can find out how applicable it is, you know, just to your own life it is in and of itself. Cool. Oh. So talking about tutoring, if one of our viewers or whoever wants to get tutoring from you, would you be interested in doing that? Of course. You know, would, you know, when I was, you know, outside the nine to five for me, I would actually be mentoring like kids and, in elementary school, like helping them to build robots and helping them like actually write code that can make the robot move forward or lift an arm or at least fire a, you know, a, what, like a 10 inch round ball into a net. And then I would actually help them to, I would walk them through what a sensor is. Why do you use certain type of sensors? You know, what, what 
you know, what's an ultrasonic sensor versus a line sensor? What is that diff How does that differ from a gyroscope? And then, you know, going from plugging it into a specific port and configuring that port number to, to detect that there is a sensor there, how can you use that sensor in, let's say, an if condition? Or how do you use it inside of a while or a do while loop? And then that just opens that conversation to say, okay, this is how you write a statement. You know, make sure you end every statement of your code with a semicolon. It's like a period. So those types of conversations just lead themselves one into another when you're working with something that's like a physical piece of hardware, like a mouse or a computer or a keyboard of some sort, or even one of these fancy smartphones. These are uh, snazzy. Smartphones. Yeah, snazzy, eh? <laughs> yeah. But like, it's so it's really interesting to see like how coding and computer science affects every little thing that we as humans are. I don't want to say ignorant, but ignorant to for the most. I part. I wouldn't say ignorant, rather, but we take for granted. Take for granted. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's the word, the word I was looking for. Like everything that we do now is all digital. So it's like yeah. you, you, you get up in the morning, you log in and it's, oh, great. You know, going back to the, the story that I had, right? It's, it's, it's funny, it's, it's nice enough to know that your, fr your refrigerator somehow managed to transfer like $5 billion into your bank account. And also it's, it's nice to know that your refrigerator is smart enough to send you a text message saying, by the way, you're, you're down to your last gallon of milk, go to BJ's, damn it, you know? and tell you to go and, and get groceries and stuff like that. For those who don't know, BJ's is a commercial supermarket in the Northeast. Yes, and, and has locations out in the West Coast as well. Yeah, so like most of us may not know what BJ's is, but to yeah, those yeah, who yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you had to clear it out for, for you know, just to get the Everyone record listening straight. and watching this. Well, yeah, it's like, yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, we just, we didn't even go in, we didn't even scratch the surface. This is actually like scratching the very, very like, you know, you know, if you look at it as an iceberg, it's like, you're just at the tip of the iceberg, right? You, you know, the massiveness of the actual iceberg is below the damn water itself. So right. we haven't even gotten deep into any of it and, and going into some things that, that I've been asked personally on, on in, in technical interviews where I've asked to, take an array of numbers and write a function that would sort it from the lowest value to the highest value, um, or to create an application within a week where it would say, given a list of numbers, give me the mean, median, mode, range, standard deviation, variance, and all that kind of stuff. Or where I've actually done this, where I've actually built a chat bot that would say, okay, give me, given this, you know, values of A, B, and C, give me the discriminant, give me the roots, give me the, axis of symmetry, the turning point, give me the distance between two points, give me the, the you know, give me the hypotenuse of a third of, uh, you know, after given, let's say, two legs of a right triangle, like, like, I've, I've, I've gotten this where it's like, all right, tell me the hypotenuse of, uh, of three comma four, it'll say, okay, your hypotenuse is five, um, you know, it'll, it'll be able to do stuff like that for you, if it's okay, just add, or give me the, you know, from statistics to geometry to say, okay, only thing I'm not, program the damn thing to do is to do calculus and that will be fun. Talking about calculus, could you program someone to do uh, some of this stuff to do calculus? Yes, it's possible. Okay. I mean, you have you have a freaking piece of hardware called the TI-89 that can do derivatives for you. Right, that's why I don't want to say most colleges, but a lot of colleges are saying, hey, don't freaking use it. Yes, <laughs> do not use a TI-89. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I still remember uh, some of my, what was it, Jungle Park? Yeah. Back saying, hey, don't use this at all, unless you yes. want to get a zero on your exam. <laughs> yes, yes, because yes. you can tell it, you can give it everything and it'll do it for you in a, in a matter of a minute. More or less. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it's pretty interesting, all this stuff. <sighs> so, we'll go, we'll probably go into it. Uh, probably stick on the console world for a little bit longer, and then we'll go into things like what are what's what's known as like solid principles. You know, uh, separation of concern, object-oriented design. Um, 
with an L, I forgot. I is inversion of control and D would be do not repeat yourself. So what does, what do all, what does that solid acronym mean and how can you create an application that maybe abides by those, by some of those principles and, and see how like that would work and how does that lead to clean code, et cetera. Right. So how would you know a bad code versus a good code? I know that's kind of a- uh, Okay, good. That's actually a really good question. So let me, I'm gonna share my screen and probably this will be like the thing that we'll end on and I'll share and I'll show you how that works. So let me know when you guys are able to see the screen and I'll show you what's bad versus what's good. So I can see the screen, but can you right, see the cool. screen? So, all right, so here's something that's bad. Let me see. Um, here's something that's bad. I wouldn't call bad, but here's something that a noob would do, okay? So this is what a noob would do and say, okay, I wanna write, I right, let me do it as a smaller number, right? I wanna write, I wanna write the same phrase three times, right? Okay. So a, a brand new programmer, or at least someone who would be thinking about programming or at least not knowing how to optimize code would say, okay, I would write the same statement three times. Hello, there's something known as a loop that can, that can be used in this case. I equals zero, I less than equal two, because everything starts at zero, by the way, in the world of computer science, nothing starts in one in programming in general. So everything starts at zero. Um, so you have two, you have an standard example where it's like, what a noob would do, and I'll go ahead and, no. Nope. What a noob would do versus, I think it's what it's, there we go. So let me get rid of this. This is something about what a noob would do versus what someone with experience So it's like you would see that they're using what's known as a loop where you can go ahead and do write one line of code, but then have it executed three times for you as opposed to writing the same line of code three times. That's one thing that you would notice from, let's say, what a uh, what someone starting out would do versus what someone who's got some experience and has some understanding of best practices would do. That's one idea, that's one way. Um, second would be is something like this, where they would have, let's say, a method name that is a little bit on the longer side. But then, you know, you could basically say, um, you know, it's like just writing a, a method name that's a little too long. Right. Or, well, let me see if I can pull this up for you. I will pull up, I'll pull up something pretty, pretty, pretty big. Um, something that I personally have my name attached to, which I do not mind sharing. Um, where you'll have one of these like functions that would have a thousand lines of code inside of it. Right. And those are the bad calm down. I didn't see, I never seen you this excited before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to be yeah, moving things. Don't worry. I'll probably go over it in another episode anyways, this way to like go completely like a lot slower and you have better chance of asking more questions as well. So, uh, and you can find this link as well in the description somewhere if you guys want to take a look at all the projects that I've worked on um, here. This one, this is actually one of the more recent. Uh, GitHub. Yep. So 
what this did, what I did here was in fact the ability to uh, da, 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 master office dev master. Oh, this is my fork. Okay, let me just go over to the main repo here, and we'll go into this code. We'll go into the API, go into controllers, and you. I, I wouldn't be surprised. No, this isn't it. This is not, da, 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 this one. This one was a nightmare to write. This is a nightmare and a half to write. And let me just make this a little bit clearer and bigger. So you see how it starts at line 122. Sometimes the method does not, this method won't really end, doesn't end until line 373. So that's about 200 lines plus of code where you can take a look and you might not, not even know what the hell this does, but believe it or not, what you can take a look at is you can see all these comments and then you can see the line of code below that, which will then give you an idea as to, okay, this is what we're doing. And believe it or not, I was the one who wrote step one, step one A, step one B, step one C, step one D, because all of these, because the logic is so complex that you would need what are known as comments. You can use these as a double backslash technique, or you can use the triple backslash technique, which will allow you to say, okay, um, gives you a summary of the method, tells you all the parameters that are being used for the method, what the hell it actually returns, and things like that. So you're basically describing what's going on every step of the code. Exactly. And, and that's one of the more important things about when you're writing any program for anything, if you're writing to control a car, if you're writing something to control um, a phone or anything like that, you need to have these kind of these kind of comments to be able to make your code a lot more readable. Because if all of a sudden I leave the com if I'm leaving a company and then Rhino is the next person that's up the next man up to actually take over the code from me, he needs to know what the hell I was able to do up until the point that I was leaving so that he can be able to take it and see it and see the thing to completion. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and go ahead onto this line, this link right here, and I'll probably put it in the description it'll, box. It'll be in the description box down below. Yeah, so github.com, codercrishna92, and then you can be able to go ahead and take a look at some of the stuff that I've worked on and what I have personally done on the side and you can see like the code behind it all. Cool. Sounds like a party. Yeah, it's a party and a half. <laughs> cool. Um, I don't have any other questions, do you? But... I actually have a lot of questions, but that's gonna be for the next episode. <laughs> Save them. I mean, if you guys have questions, you know, you can, you can go at Rhino and the Bat, uh, send them over, or at pcrush19 on Instagram. You can always send them over to me, and then I can do my best to amp to bring it up in the next episode. Right. Um, and, what uh, would be what be really nice is if we can go live on YouTube and then send it out and see how many people actually tune in. Yeah, I'll be. I think that would be cool to send. <sighs> okay. Cool. So I remember you mentioned earlier that uh, at at school, you um, you said that you guys did something about the NFL schedule. So yeah, so there was an article where they actually had gone into. I actually took an AI course, an introduction to AI. Um, you. Where they had something about creating the NFL schedule and each person would actually say like how all the rules were programmed into the were programmed into this algorithm supposedly that was um schedule generation So they have this, they had something where, I think here it is, 
here is actually the, the exact uh, white paper or, or article from, uh, from Cornell University, which goes into the US National Football League scheduling problem, where you take a look at the fact of um, all of your rules and all of your scheduling strategies and the application that is required to even demonstrate this and having everything done in terms of your schedule interaction, all of your, and basically they've gone into an application in Java where they've done, I don't know if they have it, um, the prototype, if it's anywhere available on, on source code or something like that. This is like a paper that you can go and look into and tells you the entire problem that you have with the NFL schedule. And it gives you the entire um, criteria is right here. Teams cannot play three consecutive home or away games during weeks one through five. You cannot play three consecutive home away games during weeks 15 through 17. You cannot, you'd have to also come and in, take into account, they have to play uh, every team twice in your division that you can have maybe like one out of conference game, one in conference game, one in division game, one out of division game to make from weeks one through 17 and not to mention um, no schedules between each team can overlap. Cool. So that's just like one application where so many rules where you can say, you know, um, given this predicate, here's your A and B, your true, false. And, and I looked at it from a standpoint in closure in my AI course, and I'm like, there are too many parentheses. My mind is already like, okay, if I'm having five here, I need to have five on the right-hand side. If I'm having three parent open parentheses and you have three parentheses that close and it's like closure became my least favorite language because of the damn parentheses character. Cool. Sounds like you have your hands full with everything else that's going on in the world. Yep. Cool. I know you're lucky that the Niners are not playing the Steelers this season. I know, right? <laughs> no. I am so depressed. I, I got so pissed off and depressed last year about that game. I yeah, think it was, was the game I went to. I'm just thinking, like, how the hell do you get, was it five picks and still lose the game? What the hell? Didn't that happen between the Jets and the Steelers as well? I think that happened to the Jets out of that game, but I think so, yeah. Where the no, but the Steelers had five picks. Michael Vick was the backup playing for the Jets at the time, right. and and everyone was like, "Oh, the the the, the Steelers are going to win it." No, the Steelers ended up losing the game, and the Jets ended up winning. Yeah, I don't know what the hell happened those games. <laughs> Not to mention the Jets and the Hawks play are playing Week 14 this year. Okay, that's going to be a fun game. <laughs> well, it's going to be fun for one side. Well, it's going to be tough for another. We all know yeah. what that is. I don't. I, I don't think Jets will ever win anything because you know it's been season, 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 same results every season. I don't know. It, it depends. We'll see about that. Right. But hopefully, hopefully, uh, we see some teams putting some upsets, except for my Niners. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I was originally over in the Pacific Northwest, so. I, I'm I'm a member of the Twelves and proud of it. Damn it! So, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. you you changed because of that. Part of it, and also okay. partly because the Jets pulled a blockbuster trade, pulling sending Jamal Adams over to the Seahawks. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. By the way, for now, you can actually stop sharing. That was a lot. great game, though, for last season for the top seed. Um, oh yeah. Really. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was. I was. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks for the heads up. Down. All right, there we go. There we go. Cool. Hey, you were saying? No, I'm saying that was actually a really good game. That was a really good game. I, yeah. I, I was seeing that. I was actually at a – where was I? I was at um, 
I was at a Thai. I was actually getting Thai food, uh, and I was like seeing the the game on um, over there, and and like the the bartender at the time was like, "Oh, I'm in the champion. This is my championship game. I'm in the championship game in my fantasy league, so I need George Kittle to pull, you know, huge numbers." <laughs> pull something out of his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what, what Shanahan would have to do. That's what yeah. Shanahan would have to do. Yeah. No, the season started two days ago, didn't it? Started uh, on Thursday. That's for for the Chiefs and that. But for, I'm just saying, like the overall season started. Like, overall season, season started, started on Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. And like the team, I don't know about you guys, but the team I'm actually kind of keeping my eye on is the Bucks with the new quarterback hello, and tight end. Hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I mean, that puts the NFC South on blast. I mean, I, I really, I, I'm, I'm actually curious to see how that will play out. I mean, um, you know, you have, you have, who is it? You have a man by the name of Drew Brees and Michael Thomas. You have Matt Ryan and Julio Jones. And then you have uh, Gronk. And then you have Brady, who also, by the way, has Mike Evans and, and Charles Godwin. Yeah. And then uh, Carolina has a fellow by the name of Teddy Bridgewater and Robbie Anderson. I mean, um, uh, okay, I mean, had you put maybe like Cam Newton and Robbie Anderson, then that would have been, then that would have been like NFC South is the, is e, is the division that is going to be the biggest one that's up for grabs, right. you know. Mm-hmm. But now the fact that the Jets have to face Cam Newton twice a year means only the fact that the Patriots are still going to run with the AFC East. Right. Like I, maybe... I, still see, I still see maybe the Bills winning that division. I, I, I was um, thinking the same thing. I, either the Bills will come I, I in close don't, second I or... I just don't see the Patriots winning again. Which I'm pretty sure a lot of people are happy out there. Um, uh, you know, I, I see the only thing that I find with, the, with New England is the fact that you have the man in the hoodie still there. Yeah, you gotta keep in, keep, yeah, but keep in mind, he resigned on a paper napkin from New York. Like, had, had, had Belichick still stayed a head coach of the Jets, we would have had Tom Brady and New York would have been having a heyday. Right. Well, at the same time, I don't know how true this is, uh, but I, what I've heard is that people are happy, like Julian Elliman is happy that Brady left because of his demeanor in the locker room. Again, I'm not saying that he was the best person to be around or be – leading the offensive unit, but at the same time, he is one of the better quarterbacks in the league. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lag on your side. I mean, like, you know, Brady is Brady. That's a given fact. You know, that you can't argue about that. I mean, you're also running a different system, too, because Bruce Arians runs the West Coast offense. Mm -hmm. Josh McDaniels. Runs, I don't know, a run and gun. Eric Coriel, high, you know, very pass heavy offense. The West Coast offensive scheme starts with the run and then goes to the pass. He was right. a very, he, you know, New England ran the air raid and ran the run only out of after the pass. The air raid is putting it lightly. Mm-hmm. No, air raid is still an offensive scheme. So I know. I'm just saying that that's putting it lightly, calling it an air raid. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to talk about it, then why don't you look uh, look for the West attempt at the Kansas City Chiefs? <laughs> that was a good game to say. Oh, yeah, that was a really good game. I mean, like, seeing, like, Patrick Mahomes come systematically back, 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 boom, to win. Yeah. I believe you also have some referees on those games. <laughs> <laughs> There's that's a hardcore night in that. Right. We'll see how Tom Brady plays in a new system. And like, you know, again, like I see players go to other teams, for example, like for soccer, Cristiano Ronaldo was from Real Madrid, had some good coaches, but then even with some bad coaches that he had, still managed to do well, but ended up not winning trophies. But we'll still see. I'm pretty sure the same thing is going to be in Tom Brady's case. Like, uh, Well, yeah, but then look at the supporting cast. And by the way, you have LaShawn McCoy and Leonard Fournette at the running back position. Um, excuse me. The, the NFC South on paper will be run all over by the Bucks. Mm-hmm. 
when least, it comes to yeah. when it when it comes to the actual implementation of it though you have dirt cutter and um now by the way y- you can see that the the running backs in the NFC South it's an embarrassment of riches Alvin Kamara, Christian McCaffrey, Leonard Fournette, LaShawn McCoy, um who who else? uh Todd Gurley Todd Gurley is in South now he is a member of the Atlanta Falcons. Wait, I totally forgot about that. A Georgia boy. Yeah. Georgia boy. So look at the the number of running backs that are there. Mm-hmm. I do agree with what you just said. Uh, so I'm basically, gonna, they're going to be running all over the league. It's like, going to be a fun game to watch the Bucks and the Saints. It's also uh, going to be an interesting matchup. You get to see Brady versus Breeze twice. twice. Yeah. You know, they're going to give – I'm pretty sure that's going to be a high-scoring game. Those will be high-scoring games. I think it's yeah. – it's it Ryan's and Jones versus Brady and Gronk twice a year. Don't forget that. You have Brady and Gronk versus Breeze and Thomas twice a year. So, again, on the whole, the NFC South, right now the Carolina Panthers just traded themselves out of, out of the conversation. Pretty much. <laughs> And, um, and, uh, and, you know, for me, it's either the NFC South or the NFC West are the two most competitive divisions in all of football. I think the AFC North is also in that mix. Well, yeah, after Ooh, they got – well, to a degree, yes, because you have Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham Jr., you have um, – Juju. Uh, huh? Yeah, Juju. You only really saying that because you're a Steelers fan. Yeah, well, yeah, but then, yeah. you know, you At had – no, no, you had Juju Smith-Schuster, you had Antonio Brown at one point in one iteration, you had Le'Veon Bell and Ben Roethlisberger, you had a team coming out of there, and then, oh, by the way, you have somebody by the name of Lamar Jackson who was, like, second in line to get the MVP last season. Honestly, I think, honestly, I think Lamar Jackson's going to break records this season as well, again, because... I wouldn't be surprised. The way he's been playing, like, you know, when we, when the Niners played Ravens last season. They only beat us by a field goal. That's because right, but we had the number one defense at last season as well. Right. But uh, then at the same yeah. time, when you had folks like uh, – and I think still he's there. You know, you'll still have Mark like, Ingram. He ran to our defense like nothing, Lamar Jackson. Oh, like, yeah. Lamar Jackson's a quick – he's a quick mofo. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking for, for you, Rhino. Right. Got to guard Lamar Jackson. Uh, we tried. We Dude, feel we to... I, I don't know about you guys, but Lamar Jackson kind of reminds me to like like a younger Michael Vick. That's that, that's the comparison everyone draws. Yeah, that's the comparison everyone draws. Anyways, because it seems like back when Vick was playing with, for the Falcons before his whole dog scandal shit show, um, he was basically doing what Jackson is doing right now. I'm just like, holy shit, this kid's like. Why the hell did we pick him up kind of thing? I mean, he he it goes around to the rest of the league like, how come we didn't draft him? Exactly. You know, I mean, you still have something similar. You know, believe it or not, uh, um, Russell Wilson and Drew Brees are the same height. You know that, right? They're five, both of them like 5'9". Yeah. They're 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, I, think, I think Russell... Uh... I don't know what the hell that was, but okay. It's going to be pretty – it's going to have a pretty solid year. I think – He will. He, he – uh, I also think Arizona is going to give us a hard time tomorrow. I think they're going to – I think they're going to be, like, up there. I mean, Who's what? There? You got one – you got one notable wide – well, you have two notable wideouts. You have the, the stalwart of Larry Fitzgerald, who, you know, has gone through hell and a half to still stay with that one team for at least 11, 12 years. I, I don't you just, see why he did that. I think he should just left personally. That's just me, though. I, well, you know what? You know, he has, uh, you know, he has his reasons to stay. Right. But um, keep in mind, he's played with, with Kurt Warner, the only Hall of Famer that he can have, say that he played with a quarterback. And, and with Kurt Warner, he attended, I think, his only Super Bowl uh, that as well, which was happened to be, by the way, in Arizona. Yeah, funny enough. Um, you have Kyler Murray, you have DeAndre Hopkins, right? Like they went all in on one wideout. 
and they, they did pick up Chris Jones, Jones and someone else off defense. I think Terrell Suggs as well. Yeah, and then they also got Chandler Jones out of Syracuse. Right, but Chandler Jones was also a Patriot. Yeah, and where he won his only Super Bowl win ring so yes. far. Yeah. yeah. Wait, so you live in Washington, I'm guessing, since you said you go for the 12 Seahawks? Uh, I'm I'm actually I'm home in New York. I'm a Jets fan as well. Like I went from the Jets to the Seahawks because of Jamal Adams as well. Yeah. Okay. So, think... basically, so basically, what he's saying is, he went from a really shitty team in the Jets to a really good team in the Seahawks. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I just had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and like what. The home of the two-time, uh, two or three-time MLS champion, Seattle Sounders. So, yeah, I hate the Sounders. They just wrecked the Earthquakes like two days ago. Seven uh-huh. one. Seven, Seven one. one. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was an interesting one game. Like I, I like I think for like the Earthquakes need to get a new goalkeeper because he's the reason why we're getting like scored. We have we still have a pretty good. Defense, but they're still scoring goals. Like you're not supposed, to, like you're not supposed oh. to block. But we should it, get what's his face, Captain America, <laughs> on the national team. Which one, Wanda Lasky? No, no, no. Yeah. Um, shoot, his name his in one of the when the U.S. was in the World Cup soccer World Cup, he was the goalie. Tim Howard. Um, Tim Howard, thank you. He, yeah, I uh, have the most. He, sick. Dude, he's in call. Dude, he's 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 out of Colorado. He's out of the MLS. Yeah, I think he just retired. I think he just retired. He plays in that uh, NWSL or the uh, USL or something like that. That dude's not retiring anytime soon. Like he came yeah. over from Everton first. Yeah. He, you know who, you know what? Tim Howard played for the Metro Stars. Yeah, he also played for like Man U at one point or something. Just United. Ever- uh, no, he didn't play for Man U. He played for Everton. Everton, okay. Wait, no, no, I think he did play for Manchester United at one point. Let's go to Google and find out. Because I remember I remember watching Ronaldo when he was back in Manchester United. Oh, he's like, here's the American goalkeeper. <laughs> the yeah. Who are the internet? <laughs> yep, I am going to it right now. So right. he is da, 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 da. Yeah, he's in the USL. Um Tim Howard. I would love to have him on the team. <laughs> yeah. We got trashed on. And we played Gal- LA Galaxy tomorrow. You got. It's going to suck for us. But... This, uh... You guys are correct. So yeah. he started out playing at Metro Stars and then from 2003 to 2006 played for Manchester United from 2006 all the way to 2016. He played for Everton, and then from 2016 to 2019, played in Colorado Rapids, and now he's in the he's playing for Memphis FC 901 in the USL Championship in the USL uh, League. So he's not retired. He's retired from uh, from EP or he's he's out of EPL and MLS. All right, one of you guys gotta explain this to me. Like I don't follow soccer or football that closely, so outside the MLS, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. (laughs) So, no, so it's, it's taught, APL stands for English Premier League, MLS stands for Major League Soccer, which I right. think and there's there's other leagues like Liga Portugal, Portugal's league, and La Liga Spain's uh, Serie A is Italy, Bundesliga right. league is German, and League Loop, whatever I don't know how to pronounce it, League is one is the French one. All right. Yep. So, a lot of Tim, South so Tim Howard went. So Tim Howard went from MLS to EPL. He went from MLS to EPL, stayed there for about thirteen years, and then came back to the MLS. Okay. Cool. Need to jump the earthquakes. We need a goalkeeper right now. Yeah, uh, talking about book. goal. Talking about goalkeepers. What happened? Whatever happened to uh, what's her name? Hope Solo. After I have no bloody idea. Because, think, like, I, because after that whole like uh, islands case or something going on, yeah. Because I remember like their, her being in the middle of a domestic abuse case, and then all all of a sudden, just like nothing after that. Yeah, and I think and I think you said something about Sweden 
like after the Olympics that was pretty controversial. Mm, yeah, remember that. And I think that also kind of slid down her career because, like, you know, there's players that are kind of like the same age that are still playing for the U.S. national team for women's. Right. Correct. Which is, I think the men should be, I think the men's, I think the men's U.S. national team would be better, will be the top teams in the coming years. Just watch. It's because America has some of the best athletes. And Juventus already has an American player playing under Ronaldo's guidance. So mm-hmm. you're going to, so I can see, we got Christian Pulisic playing at Chelsea. And uh, so you're probably going to see America being one of the top teams. In- I would like to see folks like Jordan Morris and Josie Altidore get together. That would be yeah, deadly. That would be, be cool. If you see Jordan Morris play for Seattle, he he runs like like no man's business, and he can shoot. So like he's got a strong foot. Um, if you pair him up with a former Sounder uh, in DeAndre Yedlin with mm-hmm. Josie Altidore, bring back you know a couple of other homegrown players. You know, Amer- there is an American talent, but we'll see what happens now. Yeah. Since you're from New York, do you go for the New York Red Bulls or for New York FC? Oh, uh, I I'm, I'm, I go Red Bulls. I go Red Bulls ever since uh, Henri came over. Cool. All right. Well, listen, I'm going to run. So thanks for having me on, guys. All right, guys. Uh, we'll end this here. As always, links to everything that we've talked about down below in the description box. Um, I'm going to put Pranav's Instagram if you need to contact him about any computer science issues. Um, as well as his GitHub coding stuff. As always, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and don't forget to check out our sponsor, Sparsoap. Um, it, again, links in the description box down below. As always, have a good one. See you in the next video. Peace. Peace.